the game introduction complete. That's all that needs to be stated. We got Tony Gerdeman here, Buckeye Scoop, Kevin Noon from Buckeye Scoop, Steve Hillwagon, uh, probably not able to join us, but uh, certainly in our thoughts today and uh, dealing with some family situations um, for uh, this week. Uh, as we talk Buckeyes, Michigan, this is huge. It always is, but on the national landscape, even more so this year than most. How are we doing today, boys? Good. <laughs> doing very well. Good, good, good. All right, before we move on to uh, the front and center matchup against Michigan, wow. Okay, I know some things played into 56-7. to seven. Uh, Some There were a few aspects of the game that fell into Ohio State's hands to a certain extent, but when when you beat a team 56 to 7 that is number 7 in the country and i think they will prove out to be a top 12 to 15 team in the country so they're genuinely legit to a certain extent and 56 to 7 is a much kinder score than what it could have been 49 to nothing kevin at halftime yeah i mean in I don't know. I don't know if I would have bet against them scoring in the final 30 seconds. They took a knee. Um, they had 30 seconds to try and march down the field. Uh, you know, at that point, you're kind of calling the dogs off. They come out, bring out Stroud in the offense for one more drive to start the second half, and then they go very vanilla the rest of the way. But you know, C.J. Stroud, are you going to bet against him throwing for 10 touchdowns in that game if they kept the foot on the gas the whole time? Are you? I mean, Ohio State had 500 yards of total offense in the first half. Are you betting against them having 850, 900 if they if they kept it going? I mean, of course, you know, that's easy to say in the world of hypotheticals. If somebody's doing that against me, I'm going for people's knees. I mean, you know, so you don't you don't there's a reason you don't do that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, it was it was the most impressive half of football that I've seen from this team maybe ever. I mean, people are like, well, what about 59 nothing against? Wisconsin in the Big Ten championship game that was over the course of four quarters and you know they certainly were not flawless in that game I mean they had drives that stalled out and some other things but pretty much everything went their way and of course you know there were some things that worked out for them that Jalen Naylor wasn't able to go uh, you know you have to wonder if Kenneth Walker the third was a hundred percent ninety percent eighty percent but the game got away from running the football very quickly, so he only had the six rushes. Jaden Reed appeared to get dinged up a little bit in the game. So you take away their what's behind door number one, door number two, and door number three, and they really weren't left with much. I mean, when their biggest offensive highlight is throwing to uh, a tight end and the, wearing a num number 97, you know, that's just how well that Ohio State played. It, it was amazing. It's the best first half I've ever seen, and – like Kevin said, people are talking about what about the Wisconsin game? That, that was 38 nothing, and there was at least one defensive score. So it's not like the offense did all of that. And this was a, a this was a dominating defense performance, flawless offensive performance, and it, it showcased some of what I've said about the Ohio State offense all along, which is they are the most patient passing offense you'll ever see. That first drive was what like 12 or 13 plays. They will take nine yard gains all day long. They're not like a lot of teams or most teams, where eventually they just they have to take a shot and, and they 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 lose themselves. And Ohio State will take shots, but they're very confident in those. And they just they can methodically just go along. Didn't have a single third down, I think, on that first drive, and that was that was their toughest drive in that first half. Everything else was so much easier. And it was it was flawless. It was as good as you'll ever see. Is is it was video game like? And uh, I, I don't know. I, I can understand why the committee was so impressed by it to move them ahead of Alabama. Which, commending them, that's what they they should have done, and they did it. The only qualification I'm going to put on this, and it is a slight one, not in any way questioning the result of the game, but in terms of um, what. I wanted to see the area the Ohio State defense would be tested in would be Kenneth Walker slamming ahead time after time after time after time. So he was compromised by an ankle. They did well to uh, contain him on the six carries that he did have. He had one decent run other than that. 
they held him in check. And then obviously the score got out of hand. We don't know how much of that factored into his availability after that. But we could see a situation this week where Hassan Haskins, much like he did against Penn State, slams it ahead 31 times. And that's the formula for a Michigan upset is that they keep that offense off the field, Kevin. But I would think that that would be point number one for Michigan, both offensively control the line of scrimmage and give it to Haskins as much as possible. And number two, keep the offense off the field. Well, Ohio State just has to chop them down. I mean, that's what it comes down to. I mean, you can't let you can't let three yard runs turn into eight yard runs. You can't allow six yard runs to turn into twenty yard runs. I've not seen anybody in a long time move the pile the way that Hassan Haskins can move it. Then you have to kind of wonder what the question is: Is Blake Corum going to be able to go? Does Donovan Edwards, who was a big weapon in the receiving game, 170 yards against Maryland, does he become the number two back at that point? Because truthfully the vast majority of the Michigan rush offense is Haskins and Corum and has been moving more toward Haskins, even with Corum not playing in the last couple of games, it had been trending a lot more Haskins and he does have a 64 yard run, but he's not going to be the guy that you're going to say, Oh, he's, you know, he's that burner. He's going to get to the outside and, and do this and do that. I mean, he's, he's between the tackles type of runner. He, you know, he's got just that leg drive. That's, you know, that's where his strength is. But yeah, if you're Michigan, you need to sit there and establish that run because some of your best defense is going to be keeping that Ohio State offense on the sidelines. Haskins is obviously a big key to this game. He is he's solid four to five yards a carry. I think he's averaging 4.7 yards per carry in Big Ten play. It's not great. It's not very good for your leading rusher, for the guy that you're going to depend on. And now he's facing one of the better run defenses in the Big Ten in Ohio State. So uh, my question is, can he reach his average? I think at the very least, Michigan will need to reach their average when, when it comes to running the ball in order to keep this one close. And you know, I, I don't know if he's going to do that. Just looking, he has 216 carries on the season. Only five of those have gone over 20 yards. Only two of those have gone over 30 yards. You know, by comparison, Travion Henderson has eight 30-yard rushes to Hassan Haskins, too, and that's not Haskins' game. I will say of his five 20-yard carries, two of them have gone for 30, then they've gone for 40, and they've gone for 50. So he breaks – It's. it feels like there's a. It, it's something that anybody could have done at that point because he's not making a lot of guys miss. Uh, so there's some good blocking there. But he is – he's solid. He's not dynamic. I think they need him to somehow be dynamic. I'm still expecting – we've seen over the years where Michigan does not have the best running game going into this game, and one of their guys still will bust a 30-yarder or a 40-yarder. So I won't be shocked by that because I've seen it time and time again. But it feels like Hassan Haskins is going to have to exceed his average of 4.8 yards per carry in order to keep the chains moving – keep the ball away from Ohio State, like you guys are saying, and, and just keep control because he only averaged five yards a carry against Penn State, but it was 31 carries. Like they had – they were controlling the line of scrimmage. Still almost lost that game despite that. And so I, I feel like they're going to contain Hassan Haskins pretty well. Does that mean – I mean, if, if he's 78 yards on 20 carries like he was last week against Maryland, that's a win for Ohio State. Right. And I know what the, the last 10 games of this series don't mean anything necessarily for what we're going to see this week, but Michigan over the last 10 games of the series where Ohio state's gone nine and one, obviously only dropping the 2011 game is averaging 134 yards per game on the ground, 16 touchdowns. So 1.6 per game, whereas Ohio state has done a much better job on the ground uh, for 2,542 yards, uh, 5.6, two yards per carry, whereas Michigan is 3.71 yards per carry. So Ohio State has generally been the more dominant rushing team in this series. But let's also not forget that we have a huge chunk of games with JT Barrett and, and Braxton Miller as the quarterback. And in those games, Ohio State really wasn't attempting more than 24, 25 passes. Which leads us to the C.J. Stroud uh, performance, which was <laughs> just – otherworldly against Michigan State but transitioning to this game with those two defensive ends and it's it's been made all about Aiden Hutchinson and um, David Ajabo but 
you know, Junior Colson's a tremendous player, Josh Ross across the front seven. Okay, just talking about most quarterbacks in this day and age at this level have the ability or the willingness, I think he has the ability to at least see openings in rush lanes and to take off. And he just seems like he won't do that. Now he did it maybe one time, maybe twice against Michigan state. But um, don't you think Tony, that he needs to be a little bit more willing to take off if it presents itself. I think now is the time where, and I think he's, I think he is willing. I think he also relies on his arm and would rather throw the ball for 11 yards then run it for four. And to me, that makes mathematical sense. Now, what Ryan Day has said is he needs to be willing to get those tough yards when they need him. And, and I think he's willing to do that. I think now is a time when that comes into play. I don't think it comes into play against Indiana or whatever. We saw him do it against Oregon when they needed 10 yards and he picked up 11 on a third and 10 or whatever and got called back for holding. And so like there, there are examples that he will do it but he would rather throw it to Jackson Smith and Jigbo or Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson. I can't fault him for that. I would not be surprised at all if this is his best rushing day once you take away the sacks, however many there may be. But, yeah, I think you, you're – you. I know there's been this knock that he's not – there's some toughness issue. I just think he's been pretty clean all year long, and, and so his, his uniform, there's no mud on it, not that you get mud in Ohio Stadium, but – He's been up, he's been standing, and now he's going to have to get a little dirty. And I, I don't think he has a problem with that, and we will see. But uh, I, I think the more important running is everybody else, and his passing is more important than his running. But on third and five, nobody's open. you got to go get it. How about we see over-under of 2.5 design quarterback runs in this game? How about that? I mean – I don't Does know. That, I mean, you know that you 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 save some things for the biggest types of games. Uh, Michigan didn't save its its kickoff return or whatever that was, where it chucked the ball across the field and you know marched into the end zone. That gave Ohio State something to prepare for, obviously. Um, but you know, maybe maybe that's a wrinkle that they have there to try and free some things up for Trevion Henderson, Mayan Williams, Master Teague. That they have a couple of those runs. I mean. Wouldn't it be something to sit there and have, uh, you know, Hutchinson bull rushing at you and you just run right by him? Uh, you know, you he gets locked up with uh, Petit Friere or somebody and he, you just go. Uh, so, you know, never, never say never. But with that being said, they've done quite well without a lot of Q runs. So, you know, who am I, who am I to who am I to second guess? Yeah, I mean, they are leading the nation in yards per carry, but we all know. Look at the Nebraska game where they rush for nine and 90 yards or whatever. And it's like, if you would just call more read plays, more run read options and allow CJ Stroud to make that read because they haven't been, and they do it a little bit here and there, but it, it's, if you see like what looks like a wide open running lane, it's, and he doesn't take it. It's because it's not a, a read, but I would expect to see some more reads and Kevin, the two and a half over under on, on, design running plays does that include the read keeper or are you just talking like draws i don't think we'll see any draws because that's just we haven't i don't know that we've ever seen that from cj stroud and but i could see i could see three carries in this game on reads and scrambles i you know i might go four well, I actually thought about setting the number higher, but then the pur the purpose of setting the number is to get action on both sides. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe maybe I maybe I set it at three and a half. Maybe I set it at four and a half. I thought if I set it at a four and a half, that everybody would slide in on the under because, you know, fool me once, fool me twice, fool me thrice. But um, you know, I I think that a lot of things could be in play for what they're going to do. You know, Ryan Day, just win the game, win the game. You know, they, Ohio State doesn't need to win it by 28, doesn't need to win it by 68. You know, one point will suffice, I mean, you know, to get into the playoff. So just just do that. But with Ohio State not playing Michigan last year, with the hang 100 on them controversy, all of that being there, I'm sure that Ryan Day would like to see this fully operational battle station go off and blow up Alderaan. What a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bring that up, not expecting, first of all, to your point, Tony, if 
far be it for anyone to criticize what they're doing offensively, what they're calling. It's it's all working and it it's amazing. Just considering again, uh, them facing the the pass rush that they will be, uh, which looks to be the best that they've faced thus far, and knowing that just pure spacing tells us that the field's fifty three yards wide. And all you have to do is watch college football in particular game after game after game. And, and it's difficult to keep rush lanes and keep quarterbacks contained where there's not gaps in the line where you can just, okay, there's a lot of grass there. I can run about eight yards and slide and uh, pick up the first down here. Uh, and he just doesn't do that. And again, not to be critical, 32 of 35, Hey, give that to us again. And uh, you don't need to, leave the pocket one time. All right. Tony Gerdman, Buckeye scoop, Kevin noon, Buckeye scoop. That seems like a good reason to check out Buckeye scoop right there. These two right there, uh, to check out their insight on the big game coming up Saturday. Yes. Noon Eastern time as it should be. And it typically is aside from, I believe, I believe 2006 would be the exception. All right. And, and let's let's keep it on um, that side of the football with the Buckeyes uh, having the football. Do we believe, and certainly last week was a good indication, Tony, that the offensive line combination has been fixed and figured out to contend with this Michigan pass rush? As figured out as they could be. And they had two games where they struggled against Penn State and Nebraska. The offensive line struggled. There was a lot of interior pressure that was really getting to C.J. Stroud as well, at least relatively a lot. Uh, and so the last couple of games, they sure do seem to have figured it out against some talented defensive lines, talented defenses against Purdue and Michigan State. This will be a little bit different. But I think as important, more important for Michigan, it's not just Aiden Hudson, Hutchinson and David Ojabo. It's the interior guys creating some bad looks for C.J. Stroud, getting into his face, and really getting the interior pressure that has given C.J. Stroud some trouble this year. And then if the if the outside guys want to clean it up, that's fine. Uh, I think without that interior pass rush, there's going to there's gonna be some opportunities for big plays from Ohio State. And then also, I just – the. The, the looks that Michigan will give him, they they stand up, everybody, they have six defensive linemen, they have five defensive linemen, they have two defensive linemen, they'll have three linebackers, two linebackers, four linebackers. They're changing stuff constantly. They'll play nickel base a lot. So it's, how does C.J. Stroud handle that? And I, I do think if they're in that nickel base, I think Ohio State can run the ball, and they don't need to go for 40 yards. They will be patient running the ball as well. They'll take five or six yards, especially on first down. And if you're going to give Ohio State five yards on first down, you're in trouble on second and third down. And, and there's a decent chance there's going to be a fourth down if it's a fourth and short. So it's it's going to be a, a with by far the most difficult task for Michigan this season. They haven't faced anybody like C.J. Stroud, the best quarterback they've faced at this point. Adrian Peterson or Adrian Martinez. Uh, uh, Peyton Thorne, Tagovailoa. I mean, you know, it just. I mean, yeah, they've not gone against a lot of stout passing teams. As I, you know, I I rely a lot on the numbers. I mean, they've gone to get, Maryland is the highest uh, passing offense at fifteen in the nation. Nebraska's twenty three. Uh, Ohio State six. So there you go. Uh, but yeah, I agree. I don't know if I don't know if they're going to be able to get enough interior pressure in there. And the, the good news for Ohio State is is that. C.J. Stroud doesn't need to wait on these guys to run double moves and 45 yards down the field to get 45 yards. I mean, we saw against Michigan State, they're, Ohio State's much much more than happy to sit there and take eight, nine-yard chunks. So, you know, what that means is that, you know, Stroud may have to step up in the pocket a few times, and that's not taking anything away from Ojabo and from Hutchinson. I think that they're going to get theirs to a certain extent, just hold on to the ball for for the love of all things holy. But, uh, you know, step up in the step up in the pocket and, and take what's there. I think this could be a big game for Jackson Smith and Jigba. I think this could be a pretty solid game for Jeremy Ruckert. I mean, we I'm not, you know, Maybe we see a wheel route to Trevion Henderson, huh, Tony? Huh, Tony? Maybe we see a couple of those. I certainly remember 
a couple of wheel routes being run in the history of this series up on the field up there at Michigan Stadium. Uh, you know, those those seem to come up from time to time. So, yeah, Michigan has not faced something like this. Ohio State's not faced the type of uh, defensive edge pressure that they're going to see from Michigan. But, you know, in looking at the rest of the line based on numbers and everything else, I don't think that Michigan's going to get a great push uh, up the middle against Ohio State. So, um you know that you know it would it would be a lot more of a difficult proposition if Ohio State was having to face those two ends and then you know two tackles that maybe were only like a half step down and I just I don't I don't see that on the roster right now. This wide receiver core now to compare them to legendary units of the past. Obviously, those names are going to jump out, and and to to compare names that are current versus legendary names, people tend to dismiss that and be like, well, those guys are legends. Well, these guys are building legendary resumes. And just for the, you know, not projecting what they're going to be at the next level, or we don't know what the next two or three games are going to hold this season, but at the the rate of production and the skill level that we see out of the, the three right now, I watch college football games all day Saturday. I'm flipping all over the place, watching everybody. And I do not see guys consistently separate almost every play and get open like these three do. It's amazing. And you watch what the offense does. And I'm sure Buckeye fans over the years have watched other offenses where guys seem to be running wide open. And you're thinking, why can't, why can't we have that? And now you do. And the, the scheming, the route running is next level, and that's the scouts love the way all three of those guys run the routes. The designs are excellent. the The quarterback is pinpoint, so like they are at the the pinnacle of everything you need for guys to be running open, and they've been taking advantage of it. and They're very good. I can't wait to see. I think you're going to see Dax Hill against Jackson Smith and Jigba in the slot some. They, you know, Ohio State will move their receivers around, but I expect Daxon Hill to be out there a lot, and uh, that'll be an interesting matchup. But you know, it's there's still two other guys that you've got to deal with, and even as Kevin said, like Jeremy Rucker. But these three guys, you're you're talking about the the best trios or whatever. I immediately went to 2005 with Santonio San Holmes, Ted Ginn, and Anthony Gonzalez, and I'm sure those guys would put up some significant numbers in this offense. But, I mean, these three, uh, they're second to none, at least from what I've been watching at Ohio State. And, you know, loved watching Terry McLaurin and Paris Campbell and, and Johnny Dixon. Those are all really good dudes. But the numbers aren't, you know, even close. And uh, they're just getting better. And, you know, Ohio State will lose Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave after this year. And then you're going to see two more guys step in. And Jackson Smith and Jigbo, Jigbo will probably have 100 catches next year and set the school record for catches and yards and perhaps touchdowns. I think he's going to have a crazy year if they keep him in the slot. Uh, it's fun times to be uh, to, it, for the Buckeye fans out there watching this for sure. Tony said second to none, and none is the number of wide receivers from Ohio State that made it into the Blitnikoff finalist list, which is a little bit shocking. But uh yeah, it's you know it's it's crazy. I mean, you know these are these are the days to hold on to, and it, as long as things are going on, I don't. I mean, with with Brian Hartline and the recruiting, you know, Carnell Tate looks like that could happen. Zachariah Branch, I mean, the the cupboard is going to stay full. It's going to be on these players once they get to the program to put in the work because I guarantee you, it's you know. Jackson Smith and Jigba and Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave didn't just roll out of bed and suddenly become great receivers. It takes a lot of hard work. So credit to all three of those guys for putting in the work, but credit to the Buckeyes for identifying guys that have that, you know, that limitless potential. And we're certainly seeing it as uh, Garrett Wilson is less than 70 yards away from a thousand yards. And what uh, Olave is what about a buck 50 or so. I mean, you know, certainly both of those are within reach in this game. If, uh, you know, if, if, if situations go correctly. Kevin, back up to your opening statement because you're confirming why I don't pay attention to these awards watch lists. None of those three are on the Bolitnikoff list. Correct. Olave was the only Ohio State wide receiver to make the semifinalist list, and then the finalist list came out, and 
Jamison Williams is on there. David Bell is on there. And the third receiver, whose name is escaping me, is is on there. And that's that. But then again, we're hearing the narrative out there that C.J. Stroud should be ineligible for Heisman consideration because he's got too much talent around him. Apparently no Bolitnikoff finalists, but he's got too much talent around him. So we should really, we should really just feel bad for Alabama because, you know, Bryce Young, I mean, he doesn't have as many weapons around him. So whatever. I'm thinking that maybe the Bolitnikoff uh, folks are a bit confused that maybe the standard is Fred Bolitnikoff's Super Bowl MVP performance when he caught four passes back in another era for 79 yards. And so that's what they're basing their standards on. Man, that's that's a shocker to me. Okay. Um, we've got a question coming in from David Greenshield concerning the Michigan passing game. Um, they were throwing the ball 8 to 12 to 15 times early in the season. They've opened it up recently, put up 352 on Maryland. I got to say I was impressed with Kate McNamara against Michigan State. Kevin, what are your thoughts about uh, the Wolverines through the air? Yeah, they've been putting up more yardage on the air because they've been putting up less yardage on the ground. They haven't had Blake Corum for the last couple of games. Corum was kind of going you know, trending downward in terms of what his role was. Haskins was a little bit of a larger role. Um, I don't think that Michigan has suddenly found something in the passing game that gives them some sort of decided tactical advantage. I mean, if you go back to the Maryland game, yeah, everybody talked about the great catch that um, that uh, Andrew Anthony had. There was another great catch, but neither of those balls were thrown very well. So, you know what? Sometimes, sometimes those catches are a result of a receiver making a play on on a ball that wasn't thrown very well. But yeah, I mean, you go through four oh six uh, against Michigan State, two thirty three against Indiana, two seventeen against Penn State, and of course three fifty two against Maryland. They're you know they're throwing the ball a lot better, but they are throwing it a lot more. Two of those games, they attempted forty or more pass attempts very different than 17 15 17 and 16 to open up the season um but Cade McNamara is who he is and you know he's not going to be somebody who's going to be throwing passes of 20 plus he's going to be somebody throwing passes of inside a 10 and then you know letting receivers get out there and try and make one guy miss and turn it into a larger gain yeah I'm with you on that one uh Credit him, nine touchdown passes and one interception in his last four games, but throwing interceptions isn't really his thing. Uh, he doesn't force the ball into places, hasn't this year, has, has thrown a couple of passes that were right into the hands of some defenders that didn't get caught. So sometimes he gets a little wild, but knows his limitations, and I, th I think his limitations can be significant at times. He has some hot moments where he can zip some balls in there, you know, 15, 20 yards downfield, but it's not often. And over the course of a game, you look at what he does, and most of his completions are within five yards of the line of scrimmage. That's where his accuracy is. It, it gets worse the further he goes downfield, as it is with all quarterbacks. But you don't have to go too far downfield for that accuracy to really uh, take a hit. Um, and for me, I keep coming back to the fact that Ohio State struggles in pass coverage behind the linebackers, around the linebackers and between the linebackers and safeties. And is that – that's not really Cade McNamara's game. He's more of a – within five yards of the line of scrimmage, quick slants, some swing passes, screens, all kinds of screens. Can he take advantage 10 yards downfield of a, a soft, at times, Ohio State secondary? And will the Ohio State secondary stay soft? Or will, as Brian Day said, you know, if quarterbacks are getting rid of the ball – quickly then they need tighter coverage will they just start out with that tight coverage because they don't necessarily fear the passing game or will they have soft coverage because they don't necessarily fear the passing game and, and you know you just you, you tackle and you make Michigan go repeatedly play after play 14 plays on a drive make them do that but I think Michigan is also okay doing that because that's their offense so I, I'm just wondering if the defense will be a little bit more aggressive to try and force some big plays or force some mistakes from Michigan. I don't think Cade McNamara really scares them. I think as long as he is safe with the ball, I guess that's good for Michigan. But I also think they need some big plays to chew up some yards, to take advantage. It's going to be hard, I think, for Michigan to move the ball. So if they can get some stuff downfield, 
they should try it. They're just not very successful at it when they do. We will uh, save the psychological warfare portion of this uh, conversation for when uh, Steve Days hopefully joins us from Michigan podcast to get his thoughts on uh, Jim Harbaugh and his crew psyche heading into this one. Uh, we've made it this far into the show. Again, real quick, Tony Gerdeman, Kevin Noon, Buckeye Scoop. These guys are uh, amazing to join us here each and every week to supply Ohio State uh, analysis. So join them on Buckeye Scoop as well. Get ready for Michigan and the conference championship game, we believe, and beyond. Um, we've made it this far through the show and haven't mentioned Travion Henderson. And uh, Kevin, your guy, Mayon Williams, he was a battering ram last week as well. They get those two going. Uh, that might um, stave off the pass rush a little bit too. Yeah, absolutely. I'll go back. Obviously, I did some research on what the last 10 games of this series looked like. Ohio State's run for 200 yards in nine of those games. The only one where they didn't was 137 in 2011. Uh, you know, running is going to be so important. I mean, we go back to 2019 which, you know, was still a Justin Fields year, and they still ran the ball 50 times, 50 times that game, 264, four touchdowns. Uh, your leading rusher was J.K. Dobbins with 31 carries, uh, 211 and four touchdowns right there. I mean, he was he was the guy. I don't know if we're going to see a situation where Trevion Henderson's going to get 30-plus carries, but, you know, I think if you get Trevion Henderson 20 carries and then you sit there and you sprinkle out another 15, 17 carries between Teague and Williams – you know, obviously that means a lot of things there. That means that Ohio State's kind of getting to pick what it wants to do. It's I think that Ohio State's going to be looking at 250 yards in that type of situation. And it probably means that Ohio State is going to be running out the clock in the second half. But uh, Trevion Henderson, I think, can do a pretty good job in terms of if the ends are crashing down and they're not getting a huge push out of the middle, I think that we could see where Ohio State seems to like to run them a lot, which is kind of between the tackles, um, you know, or you just sit there and you just you you use the aggressiveness of Ojabo and you run right at him. And, you know, and you just hope Ojabo gets locked up and he can't do anything and you're in the second or third level by that point. So, you know, we can talk everything about C.J. Stroud doing this, that and the other. I really like Trevion Henderson to potentially have a pretty big game against a Michigan defense that hasn't given up a lot of yardage this year. But they're giving up more and more on the ground of late to some running backs. And Maryland's running backs ran on them a little bit. Penn State's running backs ran on them a little bit. So that's a pretty big concern if I was a Michigan fan, considering Ohio State has better running backs, better offensive line than either of those two teams and the threat of the pass. So I feel like Ohio State will be able to run on them if they if Ryan Day chooses to. And it just depends on what his mood is in terms of the running game. But I think you can go back to – it's like 1999 or 2004, some, you know, 20 years back, the team that has averaged more yards per carry in this game is one. And I think one time they were tied and uh, maybe Ohio State won that one or Michigan State or Michigan won that one. But basically, if you rush, rush for more yards per carry in the simplest terms, you're going to win this game. Do I think that that could change this year because of Ohio State's passing game and being so dynamic? Yeah. Do I think it will? No, I still think if – if Ohio State is rushing for five yards a carry and, and Michigan is four, I think that's good things for Ohio State. If Travion Anderson has 30 carries, that tells me it's a one or two score game at best because they are just – they're a little bit nervous right now and, and relying on Henderson and just continuing to feed him. If he has 13 to 16 carries, that feels like a pretty comfortable game for me for the Buckeyes. All right, uh, we've got uh, Steve Dace, I believe, available from uh, Michigan Podcast. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing, guys. I'm doing well. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you loud and clear. I think we've got you just fine. we got uh, Kevin Noon on the line from uh, Buckeye Scoop, as well as Tony Gerdeman from Buckeye Scoop that uh, are at the core of our Buckeye show that uh, you should, Steve, make a part of your viewing experience each and every week. Um, I've been a Michigan fan since 1983, Mark, including the last 20 years. I've seen, with all due respect to our guest, I'm sure they're great guys. I've seen enough of the Buckeye show, but thank you. 
All right. I get the opportunity and the pleasure to, to, to talk to Steve each and every week and to, of course, Tony and Kevin, as well as all sorts of Michigan and Ohio State discussions. So I would be good to uh, just kick back and let you guys uh, slice it up. So um, let's start with uh, Tony, if you want to hit Steve with anything and you guys can just take it away from here and I will kick back and enjoy. One thing I am looking for is JJ McCarthy in this game. I think he, I don't think he played at all against Penn state because of the nature of the game. And it was a little bit closer and, and maybe they didn't want to expose him to that. I think that he plays in this game. I think Michigan needs to use all of their weapons. I think he's one of them. He just needs to keep the ball off the ground. But I, are you expecting him to play as much as he does or even maybe a little bit more in this one? I think the game situation will dictate it for sure. Uh, but uh, he will certainly play. And, you know, if you look at the team that Michigan has this year, uh, this this entire season was really about can Jim Harbaugh win enough games to save his job because they have had when, when, you know, it, at Michigan, it's, 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 it, it is at, you know, athletically, obviously at an elite level as an athletic department, but there's a, there's a certain culture there academically. Um, you know, if you're not a Michigan fan, you refer to it as elitism. Uh, but there is a certain culture there academically that, you have to fit into. If you look at Harbaugh's 2017 recruiting class, that was, I think, the number four class in the country. It was just decimated by attrition guys who could not fit into the, the campus culture at Michigan and left. These last two classes, 2019 and 2020, have been the best combination. And this is you know, what Harbaugh had to do at Stanford, very similar. Uh, it was the best combination of campus fit and overall talent that he has recruited uh, in back-to-back -back classes. But a lot of these are young guys. You know, nobody knew what a David Ojabo was at the start of the year. Now he's, you know, on number 10 on Mel Kuyper's big board. Um, and so I think this year was about can Harbaugh win enough games to get to next year when he when guys like J.J. McCarthy, Donovan Edwards, uh, Andrew Anthony, some guy, A.J. Henning, some guys that have flashed here and there that they're not your typical over the last decade or so, um, you know, Michigan skill uh, level player. They're, this is a different level of skill level talent. Can he win enough games to get to those guys? And lo and behold, they ended up going 10 and one way beyond anybody's expectations. And I think you saw last week, there was a key moment in the Maryland game when JJ comes in, first of all, Harbaugh would, Harbaugh was very angry at Cade McNamara. They have been all over him all year long uh, about his low release point. Uh, basically he has a John Navarre release point. If you remember back that far, but he ain't six foot five, like John Navarre. Okay, he's six foot one. Okay, and it's one thing to have athletic def defensive players batting balls down the line. It's another thing when you're throwing him into the back of your your own team's helmets. And and Harbaugh benched him for a series. Had not really done that much of this year. Uh, there, there there's always been a plan with JJ when he would play. There's never been hey we got to send a message to Cade. They benched him. Harbaugh really gave it to him on the sidelines for throwing sidearm and losing his mechanics. They put JJ in and let him run an entire series and he leads them right down the field for a touchdown. And when they get to the goal line, he actually, even though we're running a check with me system, like a lot of the spread teams are these days, he actually checked out of the play that was called and went to an audible and ended up getting a touchdown on that play. That's just kind of one of those, all right, maybe the kid is ready now kind of moments. And I give, I give Harbaugh credit. It would have been very tempting to play JJ right away. And and if you go seven and five, that's kind of your get out of jail free card. Yeah, we went seven and five, but we had the freshman five star and we got him ready and he's ready for a, he didn't do that. He didn't he didn't risk, you know, serving a wine before it's time. And Kate McNamara, even though his development this year has been slow, he has really come on in the last few weeks. I think that's not a coincidence that it, it's, it's kind of emerged alongside of JJ's uh, emergence, too. But I agree with you that you're going to see him on Saturday. How much? I don't know. You know, it, and one of the things we've seen in the history of this series is, you know, outlier performances. I, and from a Michigan perspective, you go back to Tim Biaka Batuka, the, you know, the, the Saturday of Thanksgiving weekend in 1995. Michigan did not have a game plan of let's see if we can run for 300 yards with one guy. It just, just happens. OK, and so I, I think if Michigan is able to do at the line of scrimmage what it wants to do, you you may see less of J.J., um, but I definitely think he will, he is going to be a significant X factor in the game plan one way or the other. Does he have to start next year? I, I think that 
you know, if you look, so we don't know what the schedule for next year is yet because the Big Ten is still reshuffling the conference schedule from from COVID. So like we've got a, it right now, at least that we're playing at Michigan State again next year. That's not true. They haven't changed that yet. What we do know is this, though, that um, at three of our first four games, depending on what the Big Ten decides to do week one with the conference schedule like they did this year, if they want to do that again, we weren't included in that. Maybe we will be next year. But our non-conference games, guys, is a scrubathon. OK, I mean, it's like it's like UConn and mm-hmm. I, I mean, a couple. It, it's just a scrubathon. That would be the perfect opportunity to hand the reins over to J.J. McCarthy and let him, uh, you know, develop. Well, I, I, should, I don't need to say confidence. If you've interviewed J.J. McCarthy or watched him for 10 seconds, he ain't lacking confidence. OK, but to get him sort of acclimated to being the face of the franchise, so to speak. I want to stay on the offensive side of the ball and ask you about Blake Corum and whether or not you expect to see him go. We saw some footage of him warming up. Not sure if that was legitimate or that was a little eye candy to try and give uh, Ohio State something to think about. And how is the Michigan running game different without Blake Corum? How is it different with maybe more of a Donovan Edwards now that he's healthy, even though we saw much more in the passing game than the running game? And just, you know, just kind of the dynamics of, of, the, of the Michigan running game, because that's, you know, something that Ohio State fans are really talking about because they remember games one, two, and three where Michigan ran for more than 1,000 yards, and, you know, the numbers haven't necessarily been the same since getting into Big Ten play. You know, it's a good observation. Uh, I will tell you, warm-ups last week, he was cutting and going through the entire process, Blake was. Now, was he at 100%, 100% speed? That, you know, who knows, but – he was doing everything that you would normally do as part of a warm-up last week. Um, I, I, w- when you look at, and this goes right to the point I was talking about at the beginning, this is just a different level of skill talent than Michigan has had for a long, long time. I mean, when you look at, uh, this is the best running back room that Michigan has had probably since the early 90s uh, when you had Tyrone Wheatley and Ricky Powers and Jesse Johnson and Ed Davis was your fourth string back. And when you look at Donovan Edwards uh, in state as a running back, he might be the best um, running back recruit the state of Michigan has produced since Tyrone Wheatley uh, in terms of national stature. Um, Blake Corum to me is a cross between J.K. JK Dobbins and Mike Hart. He, he is more explosive than Mike Hart was, not quite as explosive as J.K. was, but the body type, him and J.K.'s body type, very similar. Um, and so I think that, that he has a different gear And now Edwards has a a vastly different gear than anybody does. But Corum has a different gear than Devion Smith and uh, Fitzgerald Toussaint and some of the other featured backs we've had. And Hassan Haskins, if you're old school, just reminds me a heck of a lot of of Leroy Horde. I say this almost every single week. They just were wearing a lot bigger shoulder pads back then, okay? But, I mean, he's he's just a truck. And he's a more explosive athlete than you think. And I think you'll see that at the combine. I don't think he'll run like 4-4. But I'll bet you on like the the cone drills and those sorts of things at the combine. I think people will be very surprised by how good he is as an explosive athlete. He just doesn't have the extra gear that Blake Corm and Donovan Edwards do. And Corm and Edwards are both excellent receivers. In fact, I mean, twenty four seven Sports compared uh, you know Edwards to Alvin Kamara with his receiving ability. I think you saw that last week. He already he set the all time record and. It really is first significant action by a Michigan running back in terms of receptions and yards. Uh, and a lot of those were throws that he picked up off the grass and just, you know, and, and it didn't lose stride or lose any speed whatsoever. It's just, it's not as labored as, as it has been for a long time around here. And, and so the big issues with Michigan is, is philosophically. And, and that's why, it, you know, especially if, if just knowing Michigan football as I do, knowing Jim Harbaugh as I do, they're going to want to, they're going to try to do what Oregon did. They're going to see that there's a proof of concept there. They're going to see in terms of talent and roster, they're very similar teams. Uh, Oregon also has a game manager quarterback. They didn't have their Thibodeau in that game. We've got our Aiden Hutchinson. Um, and I think that, that, that Harbaugh is going to try to do complimentary football. But I also think he will do it with several wrinkles that maybe we have not shown a lot during the year um, to try to see if he can get up a quick score and and immediately try to put some pressure on Ohio State uh, from a from a mental standpoint after coming off a game where they you, you all just played a video game against Michigan State, obviously. And so for Michigan, this will be the first time 
um, that that really since you know uh, you guys faced teams that had Chris Perry, Jason Avant, Braylon Edwards, that Michigan has had this level of skill position talent collectively. It's just a lot of these guys are really young and just kind of coming into their own right now. And my concern is you see a great catch from Andrew Anthony. You see a great catch from Mike Sander still. That, that's right. their one target for the game. And right. it, they don't use all of the weapons that they have. And then Donovan Edwards shows up, not quite out of nowhere, but certainly out of nowhere in the passing game. That's 10 catches. And you're like, you should have held on to that for a week and sprung that on Ohio State. And I – I do think we'll maybe see some six offensive linemen, some jumbo looks that three tight ends. I think that's pretty normal. Minnesota had some success with that. Oregon had some success with some things uh, with some leverage. I think Ohio state's leverage defensively has gotten fixed a little bit, but it may is maybe it's time to test that theory again with what Michigan wants to do, but defensively with the Wolverines, the secondary, I don't know. I, I don't think they've been overly tested this year. I have the utmost respect for Daxton Hill. I think he's as talented as anybody in the Big Ten. I think DJ Turner has gotten better all season long and, and has maybe been the best Michigan cornerback in, in, in a few years. Um, the the freshman safety playing now, Rod Moore, I know we have some people that really liked him and thought he should have been offered by Ohio State. I think he's going to get better, but that nickel defense that they have right now going on. Like how confident are you in there in that secondary? How much do you truly know about what they are capable of doing this week? Well, I don't, I don't think there's any defense in college football and I'm including Georgia's that can be prepared for what Ohio state throws at you on the outside. Okay. I mean, that, 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 that's just a, it, it, it's a treacherous situation. So you can't, to me, you can't, you can't beat Ohio State by trying to compensate for that weakness. So what, what Georgia would do is, is, is say, you know what, we think our four guys up front are pros. And we're going to let them do their job. And we might be a little leaky in the run game. I heard you guys mention this as I was getting ready to come on. The reason you've seen Mich Michigan be more leaky in the run game the last couple of weeks, it's been philosophical. It has been, and I think it's been philosophical largely leading up to this game, which is um, we, we can't play a, 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 a seven or eight man box against Ohio State. And, and, and really, that was Penn State's game. Uh, if you look at every game Penn State's won this year, Jahan Dotson scored a touchdown. If you look at every game they lost, Jahan Dotson didn't score a touchdown. All right. He got targeted like 16 times against us for like 60 yards. Mm -hmm. And so we were willing to let them average four and a half, show the patience that they're willing to execute at that level and, and, and in order to unleash the pass rush and then keep the majority of the back seven back uh, in, in order to, to stop them from beating us over the top with Dotson. I think you will see Michigan play a very similar style on Saturday. I wouldn't be surprised if Michigan decided to take DJ Turner who a lot of people thought was going to be, you know, the best corner on the team this year, right from the start. Um, he's a, unlike Vincent Gray and, and Jamon Green. Those guys are good players, but they're not plus athletes. Turner is a plus athlete along the lines of what you guys are accustomed to seeing from Michigan's corners for decades. And so there was hope that Turner was going to be that guy from the beginning. He's becoming that guy the last few weeks. I would not be surprised if we decided to put him man to man on Olavi, just simply because of the three you have, that's the guy that probably has, and, I, and I, this is going to sound like a, 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 a detriment, but it's a little bit like saying, I think he might only be a top of the second round pick. I mean, that's, you know, so that's the one guy that I don't think goes and blows up the NFL combine in, in a few months. I think Smith Ojigba and, 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 um, um, the other young man's um, name, I'm forgetting. Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson, thank you. I think they clearly do. And so I wouldn't be surprised if you saw Michigan say, we will play a lot of man with Olavi, uh, with Turner, and the rest of this team, we're, the goal is to limit possessions and then get into the red zone and let's play red zone roulette. And and let's see if if, if Ohio State can score a bunch of touchdowns. Ohio, I, I would be shocked looking at the weather forecast and everything else. I would be shocked if Ohio State did not get 500 yards on Saturday, okay? I, I, because I think Michigan's going to, frankly, give that up. 
I think, I think Michigan is going to say, I think what you're going to see is a lot of four man rush. I think you're going to see James Ross, who is a very fast linebacker, not Devin Bush, but few are, but is not good lateral quickness wise in space. I think he will be, instead of spying the quarterback, he will spy Henderson as a downhill thumper in the, in the run game. That'll be a one-on-one -on -one matchup. I think most of the game. And then I think it is, we don't care if Ohio State, it's similar to the Giants, Patriots, Super Bowl, or the Rams, or I'm sorry, the Buccaneers and uh, the, the Chiefs last year. We don't really care how many yards y'all get between the 25s. Have all the yards you want, get all the PPR yardage you want. We'll get into the red zone here and see if we can play, uh, uh, you know, red zone roulette. And then limit the game from a possession standpoint on the other side of the field. I think that will be Michigan's game plan on Saturday. Um, but I don't think there's any secondary that can be prepared for the receivers that Ohio State throws at you. And and back to what you said before, I actually liked putting the Edwards stuff on film because I think what you're going to see is Edwards, Haskins, and Corm all in the game at the same time. And 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 two of them in the backfield, one of them lined out in the flat in the slot. One of the one of the guys in the backfield goes out into the slot to to because you just try to try to basically do without running backs, which you guys do with receivers. Okay. Mm. Good luck accounting for all three of those guys at the exact same time. And even if that's just to run the ball between the tackles with Hassan Askins to get eight yards instead of four, that keeps that clock moving. That limits the possessions of the game. I really think this is like a final four game in college basketball where you've got a team of that, 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 that is a tempo team that wants to get up and down the floor, like a Gonzaga, for example, versus a team from, you know, a, a, another power conference team that, really wants, you know, first team to 70 wins. And whoever is able to manage that tempo, I think is going to win the game on Saturday. Like 30 years ago, Loyola Marymount against uh, Wimp Sanderson with Alabama, where or he's holding Michigan, teams to 60 the, uh, points. Uh, yes. No, against no, us no. in the second round of the, play, of the tournament. Yeah, they put up like 140 points or something against us. But yeah, I think, I think Michigan believes that they can win the game 38-34. I don't think they believe they can win the game 41 38 45 40 unless we're talking about overtime of course i think they think they could win that game um but i don't think they think they could win the game at the tempo that ohio state truly wants to play at i'm still trying to envision playing man on olave at this point because there's so many points where i've seen this year olave has a great history against michigan i mean olave's breakout game as a freshman was against right. michigan who's this 17 guy oh my god he's got you know he had that first score i mean he's done well against them uh you know so many times that we've seen if we're if, if we're if, if he's even he's leaving i just i just you know that just seems like a very dangerous game to play right there to try and go man on on olave just based on just the tactician he is and the and the and the the tools that he has at his disposal. Well, there's two reasons. For, I don't think they will do that exclusively in the game. McDonald is going to show you guys a lot more looks than you have seen from a Michigan defense probably since the car era. This is kind of a throwback to the way Michigan played defense for a long, long time. Um, very multiple, very situational, uh, and it's not reliant on a particular ideology as much as Don Brown's defense was, which was – you know, very, I mean, the guy had like four top 10 defense or something here. And, but the problem was when Ohio State figured, figured out, well, we can just throw over the top of these guys. We didn't have a, a counter punch. And I think for McDonald, that he comes with, from an NFL background where you reinvent yourself depending on the opponent. There's very few ideologically convicted coaching and very little of that in the NFL. These guys reinvent themselves week to week based on what they think they can do against their opponent. And I think McDonald is much more pragmatic along those lines. But I, I suspect that if there are times that we think like a third and three, third and four, and we and and so uh, that there if there is there are going to be times we're going to play man. We played some man against Dotson a couple weeks ago with Turner, as a matter of fact. We didn't just give him all zone or soft zone looks. I think that there will be times that Michigan will choose to do that and because I think Michigan's number one concern is that C.J. Stroud cannot sit back there on his spot like he did against Michigan State and, and turn this into a video game and get comfortable. Now, they're not going to be reckless, you know, so you guys can arm punt us like we were for many years or, or, or um, crossing route us under Don Brown. They're not going to do that. But they're not going to sit there and just let C.J. Stroud uh, decide, to, you know, let's see how, what, you know, what, how much far guys can my guys get down the field before they're, you know, I can just throw it over Sparty's head. That, they're not going to do that. They're gonna, they're, they will mix it up a little bit. Uh, even 
aside from the pass rush of Hutchinson and Ojabo, I'm just interested to see how CJ Stroud handles all of the different looks from McDonald with, uh, you know, 11 guys essentially standing at the line of scrimmage with, you know, the, the corners out wide or whatever, but right. just the, like, like the last play against Penn state where everybody was at the line and Sean Clifford had no idea what was going to happen. Right. So he just threw it up. Right. And how does, how does CJ Stroud handle that? Cause it's going to be the first time they've looked at that, that, he, that he's seen it. And, and he's had so many firsts that he's experienced this year. This is not, this has not been one of them and we've seen some slow starts. So I'm, I'm thinking we might see that again on Saturday, just as they uh, try to figure everything out, and then, and then how does how, how does Michigan handle the adjustments that Ohio State adjusts to? Basically, I think that's a great point. Uh, and and to me, the biggest concern for Michigan, I, I you guys know Ohio State better than I do, of course, but I, I kind of chuckle at this notion that C.J. Stroud. I keep hearing this. Well, I mean, he really struggled against Oregon. Dude threw for 484 freaking yards. Okay, I mean, come on, guys. Okay. To me, the difference is Travion Henderson. Is Ohio State hadn't settled on him or he wasn't ready yet. I don't know your situation, but he wasn't the bell cow yet. And so what you have right now in this game is you've got the top two rated running backs, according to 24-7 Sports last year, in Donovan Edwards and Travion Henderson going head-to-head -head in this game. And uh, to me, that's my concern. My, my concern is, 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 is not even handing the ball off to Travion Henderson. James Ross... This is his fifth year here. He could even come back for another year because of COVID if he wants to. He's played so much football. He has seen it all. He's a legacy kid. His family, his brother played here. His family, they've been Michigan fans for decades. I'm not so much concerned about him coming downhill against Henderson. I'm actually far more concerned about Michigan getting overextended defensively downfield with those receivers and throwing the ball to him out of the flat with a ton of space to operate. That is not James Ross's game. He is a classic Mike linebacker, uh, you know, that th with a neck roll. Okay. It, it, basically it's what you all saw against Ohio state where I'm sorry, against Alabama, where somehow Steve Sarkeesian was a genius because he figured out, Hey, when they put a linebacker on a high Heisman trophy guy, throw it to him. That somehow made him Vince Lombardi or something all of a sudden. Okay. That is my concern is there is going to be ample space in the flat. There just is. You guys got to put that kind of talent on, on the field at receiver, you're, you know, what you'll, you're, you're going to get stretched, vert, you know, horizontally every bit as much as vertically against Ohio State. And then dumps off, dump offs to Travion Henderson in space against James Ross. Because the linebackers we have that have the athleticism to, 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 to be a better matchup, guys like Junior Colson, Niall Hill Green, these are, again, young, one's a freshman, a redshirt freshman. A lot of our best talent is in the, is in the, is in the last two classes. And so that is my concern. That's another reason why I think there will be some select uh, possessions on Saturday with man defense, because they get Michigan's number one issue is they cannot allow CJ Stroud to get comfortable back there and just pick them apart. Awesome stuff from these three. Uh, you can catch Steve. And I want to let you know, before I say this, Steve, your, your name looks especially good at, pressed up against that uh, scarlet background. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can get Steve Dace on Michigan Podcast, uh, and I he, I am uh, fortunate enough to join him for a segment each and every week. But uh, Steve Dace, Michigan Podcast, it is amazing stuff. And if you're an Ohio State fan, you need to know your enemy. So head on over there, check out his work. If you're a Michigan fan and you don't know about Steve Dace and Michigan Podcast, get on over there like right now. All right, uh, Steve, we appreciate you stopping by. Uh, what are the plans on Saturday? Have they changed? No, no. In fact, oh, come on. Oh, no, no. no. In fact, you got to the tell better, these two about your plans on Saturday. This the, the better the better this team got, the more likely it was I was going to see it through. Okay. If we were like, you're going to be six and six and Harbaugh's ass was in a sling, that's when I've been like, okay, I want to see be here to preside over the funeral and drive a stake through it. But the fact that the team is this good this year. Uh, makes it even more certain. I'm a Ghostbuster Saturday. I can't do it anymore. I've done it for 20 years. I mean, and 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 and, and here's in all seriousness, I love I love this team. Uh, I mean, other than my family and my faith, nothing's brought me more joy in my life than being a Michigan fan since I moved to Grand Rapids when I was 10 years old. And I I hate the way that what's happened in this game. That's not even a rivalry anymore. It's a spectacle. It's a tradition. It's not a rivalry. Hammers and nails aren't rivalry. Windshields and bugs are not rivalries. 
you know, uh, boots and ants aren't rivalries. Okay, this is a spectacle. It's not a rivalry. And what I what I really hate about it, in 2018 we had a great season. 2016 we had a great season, and it just felt like it, the last the previous three months were a waste of time. And not in the way that it felt like when we lost y'all when I was a kid. Okay, in that in that well screw those guys we'll get them next year in that we're just going to have this happen to us again next year and and a man's got to know his limits i i don't it was making me negative and i don't i don't want to you know jimmy was my favorite player growing up as a kid i just watched the 86 game again last night and if you guys have never seen that on youtube uh the production of the intro and everything that cbs put together for that it still holds up to this day 35 years later I, I didn't like the fact that it was turning me into, well, for lack of a better term, a prick. I didn't like it. And I just decided after after what happened in 2019 that I, I I just have to, you know, until Michigan shows me that it's worth my time to invest in watching it again and no moral victories with, you know, Devin Gardner on a broken foot don't count. Right? It's not, you know, hail to the moral victories. It's hail to the victor's valiant. So until they do their part, I, I just can't put myself through it again. I'm looking forward to the Rose Bowl here in 38 days. Pretty confident that's where we're going to end up. And I'm going to enjoy a 10 and one season. I'm going to be at Ghostbusters Saturday with my family. So Michigan does the absolute near impossible and pulls it off. Nobody will be more ecstatic than me. I'll enjoy all of the ratioing. I will be getting on Twitter from every Michigan fan that thinks I've pushed out. I'm totally okay with it. I just, I, I have to, I, I, I got enough negativity in what I do daily for a job. I don't, I don't need this to be a Michigan football fan. So I had, I've, I've got to eject, man. I just can't do it anymore. Steve, I love you. You are not allowed around my son. I've been trying to prove to him for more than 10 years now that this is a rivalry and he always points at Michigan state or Penn state or Wisconsin and says, well, those games are tougher. How is this a rivalry? So I've been trying to prove that for years and years my, and years. My but, son yeah. has gone from, when I gave him a Christmas present back in 2016 that I was taking him to his first game at the big house, I got it on camera. The kid began to cry. Okay. He's gone from that to we're not watching the Ohio state game this year. Are we? That's what's happened with my son. So guys, Purdue has beaten you all more this century than Michigan has. They haven't played every year, you know? So I, I just, I, I just, um, you know, I, I, I can't do it anymore until, until they show me it's worth my investment for my own peace of mind, sanity, and emotional well-being. I just, I can't do it. I can't kick a guy while he's down. I mean, I kind of feel bad now. I mean, I'll get over it in a minute, but I kind of feel bad right now. <laughs> well, you know, there are wild swings in this rivalry, you know, and, you know, this has actually historically not been a rivalry where they've gone back. The 10-year war is the one exception where that was 5-4-1. and one. But mm -hmm. historically, this has been one of these programs dominates for an era and then the other one does, right? I mean, so... Things that our sons, Mark, don't realize is prior to this era when Ohio State went 17 and 2, Michigan went 10, 2, and 1 in the previous era before that, right? So the John Cooper era. <laughs> yes. There have been wild swings. Often they have it, they, they happen at moments you least expect it. 2001, Ohio State's what, six and four. Michigan's playing at home to win the Big Ten championship. And that was the Jim Trestle guarantee game. And that's what kind of flipped the script in the era we are in now. And you go back, of course, Michigan fans remember. 1969 and that sort of flipped the script from the paradigm back then you know so there there have been wild swings and in this rivalry um but they, the the reason why they're usually outliers is because we didn't see them coming steve i will say and i think you can appreciate and understand this from the other side of the rivalry Ever since I saw Bo Schembechler carried off the field 22-0 in 1976 and lived through all of that, mm -hmm. uh, on through him beating Woody Hayes over the side of the head the last three times, and then on through what we talked about with John Cooper, when those two teams get on the field, Ohio State could win 20 years in a row. When those two uniforms get on the same field, it brings all that back. So there is still a shred of fear ingrained in me anytime I see those winged helmets on the same field as Scarlet and Gray. It just won't leave. Well, that's why I'm going to watch all the pregame stuff Saturday morning because it is a grand tradition. Relive all of that. And I believe Ghostbusters starts like at, 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 we're on Central Time where I live. So I believe Ghostbusters is at 1130. So as soon as game day, as soon as 
Corso puts on the, the Brutus Buckeye headgear. That's my cue to eject. And I wish you guys well. And I'm going to enjoy our first trip to Pasadena in 15 years. Steve, if this was 2-17 and 17 against Notre Dame the last 19 outings, I would be rooting like hell for you to get lifted out of this mire. <laughs> but I, of course, just can't do it. I hear you. I'm, I'm feeling you. I get it. Trust me. If this, dude, if the shoe is on the other foot, man, I mean, I'd be Cobra Kai right now. Okay? Finish them. <laughs> All right? So I get it. Totally. I understand. Steve, you are the best. We appreciate you so much. And again, everyone, Michigan Podcast with Steve Day. Steve, we appreciate it. Uh, enjoy Ghostbusters. You bet. You guys have a happy Thanksgiving. Take care. Thank you, you so much. Yep. All right, guys. Steve Day's Michigan Podcast. Uh, there's nobody like him. He does a great job, just like you do, guys deliver here constantly every week and at uh, Buckeye Scoop there every day. So, uh, Kevin Noon, Tony Gerdeman, you guys need to lock in on Buckeye Scoop over the next several days in particular as we take it through, of course, uh, hopefully a Big Ten championship game and the playoffs with Ohio State football. Guys, is there anything in particular you guys need to uh, let people know about? I've got like a quarter of a Subway sub here that I'm waiting to finish as soon as we're done. But other than that, no, not really. All right. Is it the cold cut combo with uh, cheese, lettuce, and tomato? That's no, how I it go. Was, it, was a, it was a steak and cheese with, oh, nice. uh, with creamy sriracha. Okay. Very nice. Well, we won't keep you from that. You guys, uh, we know that you will do a bang-up job covering the game, but enjoy the game as well. And we will see you back here next week. You too, Mark. Absolutely. Everybody, we've got a Michigan show, and Tony's going to join us for a few minutes. Michigan live on all these same channels at 5 Eastern. So join us then. We'll see you then.